I am um, delighted to be here in Chesterfield. Um, I am grateful for, uh, Carl talked about my work with the county government. It's a mutual uh, uh, feeling of trust and respect. I, um, I was talking to um, University of Richmond students yesterday afternoon and they asked me, well, how do you get engaged and how do you stay engaged? And it was a hard response for me because I'm talking to a bunch of young people who aren't going to stay put. And I said, well, you know, aging in place has its advantages. And one of the advantages of aging in place, like I've been in my, um, in my position or in, in this associa the Association of Realtors for 25 years. And so I, I tell people, I used to say I'm a happy dinosaur because no one stays anywhere for 25 years. And now I just say I'm aging in place. But the value of that is that you establish long relationships. And so um, I work with Joe Casey when he was in Henrico. I was delighted that uh, Chesterfield chose him as their administrator. I've worked with Kurt and Carl and Jimmy and Steve and uh, Bill Dupler uh, for years and years. Prior to that, I worked with Tom Jacobson. So um, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be here. I grew up in Chesterfield County. I am a proud graduate of Manchester High School, the one with the round building. I, I'm not sure why they built a round building, except they knew it would come in handy when people wanted to haze the freshmen. And you'd say, go find the elevator in the round building, and they would just, you know, do laps and laps and laps. Um, my mother actually graduated from Manchester High School when it was, when it was in the city, which is what um, Elkhart is now. So um, we have a long history in Chesterfield. My parents are still here, and so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I always feel because I got such a strong uh, public education in Chesterfield, I will always feel uh, indebted to this county for what they gave me, they gave my siblings in terms of education. So anytime I can give back, I like to be uh, able to do that. Now some of you may be asking, why do you ask an executive of a realtor organization to speak on uh, community enhancement, community empowerment? And what I would say to you is, uh, and we have a number of realtors here today, they know and we believe strongly, it's one of our, our corporate values, that people won't buy a house until they first bought into a community's quality of life. You may rent, but you're not gonna buy, you're not gonna spend that kind of money, you're not gonna make that kind of investment and really a commitment for your future unless you believe in a community's collective quality of life. And so one of my, jo my jobs, really my job, is to get up every day and ask the question, how do we enhance our collective quality of life? Carl mentioned our partnership for housing affordability. It is that, it's a public, private, nonprofit partnership. We've had that um, organization since 2004. We've put over a million dollars into that organization. We are serious about it, uh, being strong partners in enhancing our collective quality of life. So whenever I'm asked to speak to a group, the first thing I do is I step back and I ask a couple of questions. First question is why bother? Not me, not why bother, so why should I speak? But why does it matter? Um, and then I ask, um, what's at stake? So my first question, why bother, is why bother for all of you to be out here on a a windy but beautiful Saturday morning because obviously something on the topic is of interest to you. Um, and then what's at stake? And I always think that you can't answer the question of what's at stake in a subject matter unless you ask who has something at stake. And I would argue that when we're talking about um, building communities of opportunity, because that's really what you're talking about here today, we all have something at stake. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what makes a community one of opportunity, reflect upon how revitalization plays a strong role in preserving healthy communities, outline a few proven revitalization strategies, and then I'd like to conclude with some thoughts about why your involvement matters. I mean, given to, that today we're talking about empowering neighborhoods, I think it makes sense to spend a few moments taking that word empowering very seriously. First, what is a community of opportunity? A community of opportunity is a community that has safe, attractive, sustainable, affordable housing, both rental and owner-occupied. The adults and children in those housing units 
have the access to affordable health care and, uh, and affordable healthy foods. The children in those housing units have an opportunity to as attend strong performing pre-K, K through 12 and beyond public education. The adults have an opportunity to hold jobs that aren't just living wages, but true wages that enable them to meet their needs and the needs of those they love. Um, the jobs, the school, the housing, all are connected by a multimodal public transportation system that reaches broadly and deeply into the region. And then woven throughout all of that is a rich tapestry of natural, recreational, cultural amenities that are open, accessible, and affordable to all. Simply put, a community of opportunity is a community in which the circumstances of one's birth do not irrevocably set the trajectory of one's life. Now, the question is, uh, are we there yet? No. Within this region, and certainly even within Chesterfield County, there are neighborhoods with vast opportunities. And then there are neighborhoods that struggle. They struggle severely. And if we ever ha help hope to address these disparities, we ha we'll have to be forthright in acknowledging this reality. And I want to applaud all of you. I want to applaud Chesterfield County and its leadership and all of you for coming out here. Because you don't have this kind of forum if you think everything's perfect, if there isn't room for some improvement. And I think this first step towards enhancing our communities is to acknowledge that they need some enhancement. In a community of opportunity, each person, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, has an opportunity to flourish. Now, I know and you know that not everyone is going to flourish. They're, not everyone's going to thrive. Sometimes life is tragic and sometimes people make really poor choices in life. But that fact that not everyone will succeed never absolves us of the obligation to create this community of opportunity, to, to create an environment that has the foundational basics so people can thrive. Now, lots of times people say, well, why should we bother with that? Well, some people feel a moral or ethical obligation. Some people feel that their, their faith compels that work. And I would say whether either of those motivations are true for you or not, your individual quality of life, no matter where you live in this county, isn't what it can, should, and ought to be until everyone has an opportunity in Chesterfield to flourish. So this isn't about doing unto others over there somewhere that aren't near you. This is about your individual quality of life and our collective quality of life. I grew up here, but I live in Henrico. I believe that my quality of life, our regional quality of life, we all hang together. But if you're still not convinced, if you're someone that it all comes down to dollars and cents, then I would submit to you that seeking to build communities of opportunity and seeking to eliminate disparities is the most cost-efficient public policy that we could possibly pursue. When our neighborhoods struggle, the schools they feed struggle. And struggling schools require, rightly so, I would argue, more resources. And the cost to uh, address instances of spot blight in otherwise aging but strong neighborhoods is far less costly than the tab for the massive intervention that is needed to restore neighborhoods and commercial corridors that have been neglected for years. You know, there's this phrase, benign neglect. I think that's an oxymoron. There is nothing benign about neglect. Neglect isn't benign and it's not inexpensive. So proactive preservation efforts and strategic revitalization initiatives are essential if Chesterfield is to maintain its many communities of opportunities. One of the most important tools in the toolbox of community preservation is something that Carl touched on, and that's code enforcement. I liken code enforcement to preventive health care. We either take care of our bodies through diet and exercise, not, neither of which are always fun, but both of which take energy and effort, or we pay a much bigger price down the road when serious med medical intervention is necessary for, say, diabetes or heart disease, right? 
That same holds true with neighborhoods. Code enforcement isn't inexpensive, but it's far less expensive than allowing entire neighborhoods to succumb to blight and then having to reverse that trend. Another strategy that goes hand in hand with code enforcement, and this is a strategy that I think Chesterfield should utilize more, and one that I know at least one housing nonprofit is um, working with, and that's rapid repair. Project Homes, a housing nonprofit that works extensively in Chesterfield, has uh, ramping up its rapid, prepare, rapid repair program. And rapid repair accomplishes two things. First of all, it meets the immediate needs of homeowners for quick repairs to their homes. And secondly, and more importantly in a comprehensive sense, it addresses the broken window theory of community preservation, and I think you all know what that is. I.e., you fix the one broken window very quickly before one w broken window becomes 12 broken windows, and you have, instead of one blighted house, you have an entire street, and then ultimately a neighborhood that is blighted. Again, it's the idea that modest investments made up front and early in neighborhoods beginning to experience decline will prevent the far more costly measures down the road. In short, neighborhood preservation is far less costly than neighborhood revitalization. But when revitalization is necessary, the question becomes how to accomplish neighborhood and commercial cor corridor revitalization as efficiently and cost-effectively as possible. One answer to this question, and it's the answer that I think Chesterfield has um, taken in its approach, and that is to align limited public resources to maximize their effectiveness. In other words, rather than taking your um, CIP dollars, your capital improvement program dollars, and your community development block grant dollars, and spreading them out all across the county, and that's tempting to do, and I'll just a name a political reality. When you have elected officials who represent the whole county, it's real hard sometimes not to be tempted to take your dollars and spread them out in every district. But when you focus those dollars and you target those dollars, you can have a much more catalytic impact. And speaking of catalytic, that's really what public dollars need to be because they're limited, right? We don't have an unending supply of public dollars. You are the public. You're only going to support so much of your tax dollars going to any one effort. And so when public dollars are limited, then the question becomes, how do you deploy dollars that in ways that are designed to spur private investment? And so for me, that's one of the most important questions our public officials should be asking. What can we do that will encourage the private sector, businesses and homeowners, to reinvest or invest in certain neighborhoods? Just as public dollars aren't limited, no government, as good as any government is, no government can sustain a neighborhood. But government policies, such as code enforcement and infrastructure improvements, can create an environment in which those who live in the community or own businesses in the community feel confident in their continued investment in that community. And it's this continued investment that makes neighborhoods healthy, flourishing, and sustainable. A couple of years ago, we had the Center for Community Progress um, came to town, and I suspect Carl and Steve and perhaps some others from Chesterfield attended this forum. We were talking about vacant, blighted properties and strategies to address those. And I had one of these aha moments um, because the speaker said, people don't leave communities, no, he said this, he said, people don't start, stop paying their real estate taxes necessarily because they can't afford them. They quit paying their real estate taxes because they quit believing in the community. They have decided to disinvest in their community because of what's already gone on in their community. And I thought it was a real, for me it was an aha moment of, yeah, we have to, one of the roles of, of government, one of the roles government can play I think really well is to do the catalytic work of strategic infrastructure investment, of code enforcement, to 
make sure there's an environment in which folks continue to be confident that they should be investing in their housing and investing in their businesses and continuing to invest in corridors. So there's two final tools in the toolbox that I'll mention. One's land trust and one are land banks, and both are new to Central Virginia. Land trust exists in over 40 states in the nation, but again, we're Virginia, so we're not, you know, we're never on the bleeding edge. Um, and until recently, there was only one land trust in Virginia. It was located in Charlottesville. But in the last two years, a group of folks have gotten together and we've created the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. The goal of a land trust and what distinguishes it from other housing nonprofits is it seeks to marry two priorities. One is to create inclusive wealth building strategies, wealth building through home ownership and equity, and then to create housing that is affordable in perpetuity. And the way we do that is that we, the land trust, acquire property, often in partnership with local governments. We've started with the city. We are um, very hopeful that we're going to have a partnership uh, with Chesterfield and Henrico in the near future. But we acquire properties at a very modest uh, uh, amount. We well, would prefer vacant parcels of land. We build a new house. We sell the house to an income qualified buyer. They own the house. They do not own the land under the house. The land stays with the trust and it's always in trust. They sign a 99 year land lease with us. And when that homeowner goes to sell the house in 10 years, let's say, they get their 50% uh, of the equity that they've uh, earned, but the equity that goes to the trust is backed out of the cost of the house, sale price, as is the cost of the land. So compared to the market, the house is always affordable, but that homeowner has gained the benefit uh, and the equity of home ownership. Um, so this is a way to enable families that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford a house to be able to do so, it's also a way to go into neighborhoods that are beginning to experience um, rapid turnover, uh, perhaps a number of homes going from home ownership into rental, and there's nothing wrong with rental. We're really clear about that. We need affordable rental. We need all types of housing in Chesterfield and in our region to be healthy and to be inclusive, but we want to make sure that we are using this tool of a land trust for housing stability in those neighborhoods that are experiencing transition. A land trust is a tool that would uh, assist in um, ensuring stability in that neighborhood. Now a land bank sounds, is exactly what it sounds like. It's to create a repository for land. So for example, if Chesterfield t undertook a review, and Carl and his team have been working on this, of all the parcels that are within its control. Parcels that it owns, parcels that are surplus, perhaps even parcels that are tax delinquent. Some of those properties might be in areas that aren't ripe for development today, but may well be poised for catalytic redevelopment, say five, seven years from now. You take that land, you put it in the land bank, and perhaps you ask the land bank to acquire more parcels, so then you can have really kind of a catalytic project that you, a mixed use, say mixed income project that spurs kind of private sector development all around it. But the idea is that he or she who controls the dirt controls the development of land. And if you want to be strategic about the future of your county, you have to think about development. You have to think about not just what, what should be developed today, but what should be developed 30 years from now. I don't think it was the case 30 years ago or 40, what, 40 plus years ago when they built Cloverleaf Mall. When they built Cloverleaf Mall, and I remember, I, was, I thought it was the coolest thing. My, my mother let me go to the mall with a friend by ourselves, and we went to, there was a pizza place that had Orange Julius. I don't know if you guys remember. I'm really showing my age. Yeah, okay. So, um, but when they built Cloverleaf, I don't think the next thing they thought about was what, what, what would be the redevelopment plan. 
But nowadays, when people build malls, they will say, we're building a mall, the next thing we need to think about is what happens with this mall when it uh, reaches at the end of its life cycle. Um, so land banks are a way to think about long-term uh, development and redevelopment. Now I want to finish, I want to um, close up with a couple of comments about your involvement in enhancing community living and why that matters. Um, you know, the older I get, the more I become convinced that how we go about our business is just as important as the business at hand. And I really think that's true when it comes to community building. The idea of attempting to build genuine community without asking the residents of a community, what are your needs, your desires, your hopes, your dreams, that's nonsensical. Why would you ever go about community building and not ask residents for their thoughts, their input? But truth be told, it happens a lot. And I don't think it happens for any nefarious reason. I think it happens in community development because sometimes the resident voice gets lost because the issues are complex, particularly the financing of redevelopment. And so you bring all these experts to the table, and don't get me wrong, we need experts. I mean, I uh, was with a, a young developer earlier this week, and he was talking about the eight layers of financing he needed to make a project work. And most of us in the room were twice his age, and we just didn't understand what he was talking about. But we knew, we, we knew that we needed his expertise at the table, and we need that. But there, we have to keep in mind, particularly when we're talking about community building, there are two types of experts. They're the technical experts who know how to do a deal. And then there are the life experts, the residents of the community. And we have to be really, I think, disciplined about holding those two groups of experts together and at the table. Because it's the residents of the experts who really have to, the residents are those experts that have to live with the consequences of our action. At, at U of R yesterday, this young woman asked me, she said, well, I know you sit on the boards of a lot of different uh, nonprofits and you work with government officials, so I'm guessing you're making these decisions. How do you know you're making decisions that, that, if, that the folks that you're affecting will think are the right decisions. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, it's been my, my practice that the first step to loving thy neighbor is to sit down, shut up, and listen to thy neighbor, right? And so listening is a critical strategy in community development and community building. The work, uh, just one example, the work that was being done around the Jeff Davis corridor, um, I think is a perfect example of this. The county leadership, county staff, Many of you in this room probably have worked long and hard on the development of the Jeff Davis Corridor Plan. And there are gonna be thousands of more hours spent to implement the plan. And that implement, successful implementation is gonna hinge on a number of factors, but one of which will be most important is that implementation is respectful, collaborative, and inclusive with the self-identified needs of the residents at the center of that effort. That's what true empowerment looks like. So I want to commend you for your interest in enhancing your communities, enhancing the collective quality of life of Chesterfield County. I, I do want to say that we, the Realtors, and the Partnership for Housing Affordability, we are honored that we continue to be asked to, to sit at the table to work on these uh, issues with you. I, it's a very um, humbling privilege to gather around a table and have honest communication and conversation about what are the needs of a community and then how do we go about um, most effectively addressing those needs. Um, Chesterfield County, I know it because I've, I, I grew up here, can be a wonderful place to work, to put down roots, to raise a family, to give back. Chesterfield is at its best when it seeks to provide that kind of environment for all of its citizens. Thank you.